The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is a proud supporter of Indian Country Today. Students at Cronkite News and Gaylord College at the University of Oklahoma cover indigenous communities together. This important work is distributed by more than 100 news organizations. This collaboration provides a much needed boost to coverage of Native American communities nationwide. Learn more at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. Is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thelohungba. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. Cherokee freedmen are now formally included in the Cherokee Nation's Constitution. The Secretary of the Interior recently approved the new Constitution, which now assures Cherokee freedmen of political rights and citizenship like all Cherokee citizens. Marilyn Van is the president of the descendants of freedmen of the five tribes. She's both Choctaw and Cherokee. Van says she appreciates Secretary Holland's positive attitude towards Cherokee freedmen. I thought that it was, I thought it was great that the secretary uh, went ahead and signed it and mm -hmm. that she is supportive of the, and she is knowledgeable and supportive of the, of the Freedmen 1866 treaty right. And she's pleased that the tribe is, is trying to live up to its treaty obligations. Citizenship rights of freedmen who are descendants of former slaves have been in litigation in some form since the Treaty of 1866. Governor Doug Ducey recently signed strict legislation on voting rights in Arizona that some say actually restricts voting rights. Karina Dominguez talked to one tribal leader about the impacts it will have on all 21 tribes in the state, many of whom live in remote areas. Governor Doug Ducey signed SB 1485 into law in Arizona, which changes the permanent early voting list to an active early voting list. Under the new law, a voter will be removed from the early voting list if they do not return one ballot in four years. This change will ensure that active voters continue to receive a ballot and free up resources. Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez and Vice President Myron Leiser condemned what they called voter suppression bills. The state knows that Navajos, indigenous communities come out early. And you saw the early vote numbers for this election. President Nez believes Native American voting rights need to be protected through congressional action. Sad to see that our state, uh, some of our legislatures, our governor is uh, bowing to national political pressure when they're supposed to be advocating for all of Arizonans. In Congress, the House passed a sweeping voting rights bill that could pit the federal government against states. The Senate is now considering the bill and Republicans dismiss it as a partisan maneuver, while Democrats say it's in response to state bills like those in Arizona. The Democratic Party, on its own, wants to rewrite the ground rules of American politics for their benefit. These laws have no justification rooted in fact or purpose other than the desire for raw political advantage. Arizona is one of several states with Republican-led bills that could further limit access to the ballot box. In Phoenix, Karina Dominguez, Indian Country Today. Tribal leaders in Montana are also challenging two state laws they say are barriers to Native American voters. One bill would end same-day registration, and the other would block organizations from ballot harvesting, and that's the process of picking up ballots in rural areas to drop off at the polling sites. The classic video game, The Oregon Trail, is getting updated with a better representation of Native people. The game's story is about settlers heading west on the Oregon Trail. It now includes a new storyline with Native American characters. The company, Gameloft, redesigned it for Apple Arcade just in time for worldwide play when the pandemic hit. The creative director made the changes based on historical inaccuracies and cliches about Native American culture. Three indigenous historians were enlisted to help. Some of the changes include less drumming and flute music in the game. The team of historians came up with more appropriate names for game characters and advocated for new roles for Native Americans. 
A zoo in North Dakota is telling the stories of the animals indigenous to the Northern Plains by using Native American cultures and languages. With five tribal nations in the state, the Dakota Zoo in Bismarck is recognizing the need to educate people about these animals in a new way. The zoo is partnering with the Sacred Pipe Resource Center to include educational components. All over the zoo, there are signs explaining the cultural significance of the animals. Visitors will also be able to listen to how each animal name is said in five different native languages. Here's the word for coyote. Shahek. Stretch. Mota. Shumukhota. Mayashlacha. Machid Jaganesh. Cheryl Carey, who is Lakota, is the executive director for Sacred Pipe Resource Center. She says the whole spirit of the project is bringing people together and helping them understand. The center is now training young people to tell zoo visitors the stories of each animal. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Tholahungva. Coming up next, for many Native Americans, high-speed internet hits a dirt road on the res. Lack of broadband is an issue for many. We'll see what's being done about getting internet to tribal lands. We've all been there. We stand on the hill, we raise a curtain, we look to hold our phone on a, a windowsill. Chances are, if you live on an American Indian reservation, you have experienced poor internet service. It's one disparity that was revealed to many non-natives during the pandemic. Trying to connect the web is spotty in many cases and almost non-existent in others. In 2019, the American Indian Policy Institute at Arizona State University found that 18% of people who live on tribal reservations did not have access to the internet. They also found that a 33% relied solely on cell phones for internet service. The cost of broadband is one of the barriers to access. Joining us today to talk about the need for broadband on tribal lands is Loris Taylor. She is president of Native Public Media. Welcome, Loris. Good morning. Doa'e Asquali. Great to see you. So let's start with an overview of uh, the challenge for internet on reservations. Uh, there are so many challenges, but let me just start first by talking about broadband as an ecosystem. And I think that's a better framing in terms of understanding what broadband is and what it can do for tribes. So COVID-19, which you just mentioned, really unveiled structural flaws, not just in the healthcare system, but also in the communication system. And what we found is that COVID-19 was really and truly an information-centric pandemic. Everybody wanted information about hospital protocols, about where to get food, about lockdowns and directives from governments. So at the end of the day, broadband is not just about hardware or the infrastructure. It's about a lot of other things, software, capacity and whether we have the people on the ground to deploy broadband or to use broadband. It's about policies and, and essentially it's about internet as being a really dominant and transformational engine of communications and commerce. So you mentioned that the, the, uh, the report from, I believe the American Indian Policy Institute um, the FCC's 2018 broadband deployment report really reports a higher number. It estimates that 35% of people that live on tribal lands lacked access to broadband speeds at 25 megabits per second um, download and 3 megabits per second uh, upload. And speeds are super important in terms of broadband. Uh, if you don't have the speed, you can have the infra infrastructure on tribal lands, but you'll still have issues of latency and slow, uh, slow speeds and information in terms of like, um, it's analogous to the dial-up speeds that we used to have. 
And so, for example, uh, if you're talking about the consultation with a doctor, for example, and, and maybe versus uh, looking at x-rays over the internet, a, a doctor-patient consultation will use about, let's say about 100 megabits per second in terms of information exchange. But if you're looking at x-rays, you're looking at up to 1,000 megabits per second. So speed matters um, in broadband deployment. I, I was just thinking as I was listening to you, another way speed matters is if you're on Zoom with a whole classroom of students trying not only to interact with the teacher, but in a chat room maybe with each other and trying to have that uh, social interaction that's so important to young people. That's exactly right. Uh, what what COVID-19 really unveiled for tribes was um, in the midst of 2020, there were hotspots that were set up across tribal homelands. And so on the Hopi reservation, there was one set up on the uh, campus of the mission school. And, on, on in, and in one particular case, I remember talking to a mother who had three children, one who was an infant. So two of her children took turns in the pickup truck during winter on a mobile handheld to do their homework. So the older child went first, the second one went second. They spent at least four hours in that pickup truck with a one hour drive home time. Now that's unconscionable. So, so right now the FCC is charged by Congress in the, in the Communications Act to administer spectrum for tribes. And what's important to understand is that in 2000, the FCC adopted a policy acknowledging that affordable high-speed internet should be available to all Americans, including those of us who live in rural and on tribal lands. So that's speaking to us. But this special responsibility has to come along with like a lot of tribal consultation that's meaningful. And I think that's where the stall is happening. Uh, we're just beginning to see the FCC consult with tribes on some of these broadband issues. Well, and there's so much there, but one question since we're talking about the FCC is, um, the Biden administration has been very good at making some really key appointments across the Department of Agriculture, across the Department of Interior. Is it time for Native people to take roles at the FCC, the FTC, and other agencies that are doing this work? Absolutely. One of the biggest challenges for tribes is that funding for broadband is across different federal agencies. They're in different buckets. So you have monies at the Department of Agriculture, some money in, at the Department of Commerce, to, you know, the Interior, uh, HHS, you name it. It's that Small Business Administration. So what we need are people not only as commissioners at the FCC or on staff at the FCC, but we also need them across the agencies. We, one of the, uh, I think, flaws in terms of deployment in, uh, for funding and for infrastructure is that uh, there's just too many buckets and there's not a uniform way of applying for these funds. So there are different requirements for each pot. Uh, each is challenging for tribes. Um, and we can improve on this with people on the front lines. The Biden administration has um, been supportive of increasing broadband, broadband infrastructure in both the rescue plan and the upcoming infrastructure legislation. Uh, how should tribes make sure to take advantage of the resources that will be there? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. We have three major acts in play right now. Obviously, the coronavirus aid relief and economic security, known as the CARES Act, was one of the first with... I believe five buckets of funding for tribes. Then the, then the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 included at least four uh, buckets of funding for tribes, including the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, which launched on I, just a couple of days on May 12th. Uh, this is funding. What's different about EBB is that it's providing funding for the first time directly to households, not just to tribes and tribal governments, but to households. 
And, and for the EBB, it provides $75 per month in terms of a discount for internet service for tribal households. It provides a one-time $100 discount so that people can purchase a laptop or desktop or, uh, or the technology needed. So there's, there's a lot of funding out there. The most recent act is the American Rescue Plan Act, which has six buckets of funding for tribes. But, but what's needed here is a conversation between tribes and, and the tribal leaders with these funding agencies. And that's beginning to happen. The Treasury Department, as one example, has been talking with tribes because it's tribes that really know what to do in terms of deployment. There's so much diversity in Indian country that I don't think people really understand. We, and so for government, in terms of governance, for example, if you look at the North, there are tribes that are treaty tribes. We have the IRA tribes, the Indian Re Reorganization Act tribes in the Southwest, like the Hopi and the Navajo. In California, it's the 208 tribes that share jurisdiction with uh, the state on healthcare and other, uh, uh, other sectors of government. And then you have the Alaska corporations and each, these make differences in terms of whether you get right of ways in the first mile, middle mile and last mile of broadband deployment. So, so tribes are now looking at ways and really setting up hybrid partnerships in, in New Mexico, for example, you have uh, several Pueblo tribes who have consolidated and pooled their resources and their efforts to bring broadband into their tribal communities. So there's a lot of consultation that has to go on. Uh, we can't look at, we, we shouldn't be relying on um, market models that don't work for us. I, I guess the big picture question, Lars, is, what should be the minimum standard for broadband, for a family, for a tribe, for a community? Well, the minimum standard should be the federal standard in terms of speed, 25 megabits per second to three, three megabits per second on downloads and uploads. Um, if, if you look at anything else, it's, it's just not worth, worth the time and investment. We should also look at the gold standard of bringing fiber into tribal communities. Fiber is the fastest, most reliable uh, highway for the internet. And, and we shouldn't do anything less than that. And we should also look at, at other ways to improve broadband deployment and penetration across Indian country. For one, we need to mandate a dedicated tribal broadband fund and require the FCC to streamline that application process. Uh, well, I think what people don't understand is that we really have three sovereigns in play in the US. We have the federal government, we have the state government, we have tribal governments. We all vie and compete for broadband. The federal government is responsible for allocating in terms of the public interest uh, spectrum that's necessary. And, and when you're competing against state interests, um, I, I think it's unfair. There's, there's a lot of parity issues that come about. Uh, tribes should be treated as the sovereigns that they are and, and be required to have their own pot of money. We also need to do something about improving our data collection. Right now, we have unreliable data that's driving broadband. So for example, um, Carriers use a form from the FCC that's called, I believe, Form 477. They collect data on who served across tribal homelands using census blocks. So if there's one household in a census block that is served, they consider that entire census block as served. And this leads to consequences that, that are unintended, I, <laughs> I would say but the, it makes tribes ineligible funding uh, for funding because they, they're, they, you know, the funder would uh, say, well, you've got service in that census block already and you don't qualify for funding. So there's a lot of consequences to that data collection. And what we're asking for right now is for the FCC to improve on that. We will leave it there. Thank you so much, Loris Taylor. Thank you for having me. And we'll be right back.
Next, we're going to travel from our world to one involving the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And nobody better to tell that story than Vincent Schilling. He's been writing a column for at least a couple of years in Indian Country Today called Native Nerd. He enjoys technology, comics, movies, he's a film critic, and he recently had the opportunity to interview Darcy Little Badger about Marvel Comics' brand new Kickapoo Captain America. Vincent joins us today with some of the details. Welcome back, Vincent. Sigal, Mark. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So he's a grass dancer, he's Captain America, and I'm telling you're telling me he's not a superhero. Well, it's it's kind of okay. Talking to Darcy a little badger made it uh clarified some things and confused some others because they can't reveal everything yet. However, she did tell me he's not the type of Captain America that's going out and fighting Hydra every day. You know, uh, the character is Joe Gomez, who, yes, is a Kickapoo grass dancer, who she told me is inspired by the mantle of Captain America. Now, he does join Captain America on some sort of excursion uh, of some sort, but like I said, she can't reveal everything yet. <laughs> so. Well, there's more to learn. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this fits into so many interesting ideas. And one of them is the paradox of competing ideas. And as you know, if you go to any powwow, you see more patriotism displayed than almost anywhere. And that fits this comic genre entirely. Yet people hold very different views about the United States and the complexity with that. Mm hmm. Well, it's 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 interesting because here we are, you know, uh, as as many folks in Indian country are aware uh, that uh, Native Americans uh, join at a higher rate per capita in the military than any other ethnicity. And yes, you are absolutely right, right, Mark, at powwows, uh, you know, grand entry is is, you know, done by veterans holding the American flag, the tribal flags, the the. POW flags. And yes, there is incredible amount of patriotism at, uh, at powwows. So, you know, some people were still coming to um, comments, making comments on social media about the fact that uh, why would a Captain America that's native be wearing red, white, and blue, considering the genocide of, you know, uh, our history. So, you know, points made on many sides, for sure. Let me ask you in general about superheroes. And the comic books are actually head of the movies in this regard. There are native uh, superheroes in comic books. Um, is this the chance to kind of catch up a little bit? Well, you know, I think that for so long, um, you know, Marvel has done, you know, uh, the best they could in terms of introducing native characters. I remember being a young kid back in high school seeing you know, Chris Claremont's The New Mutants with Danielle Moonstar, who is a native woman as part of the New Mutants universe. And I was like, wow, what is this, a native woman on a comic book? So, you know, there, there are quite a few uh, native characters. And now there's Echo coming to the Hawkeye series and Disney Plus, who is a deaf Native American superhero. So I think Marvel is doing a good job of catching up, you know, uh, and they're they're doing the best they can not to embrace all of these stereotypes that have existed for so long. So I think that uh, Marvel is uh, making some good strides, you know, in 2021, and I, I look forward to can see what's going to continue to happen. This is um, almost a unique moment in terms of native contribution to public entertainment. Maybe talk about that from your perspective. Well, gosh, you know, there, there are so many opportunities for, for Native content in this Marvel universe. And, and I think what Marvel is learning, as well as other, uh, you know, people are learning in, in terms of television, radio, uh, radio, film, everything, that the Native narrative and that Native storyline is a storyline that's been needed to be told for a long time. And it needs to be told by Native writers, Native authors, and native artists. And, um, you know, I've heard behind the scenes that that people are chomping at the bit to get this content because it hasn't been told. And what they're discovering is something that you and I already know, Mark, is that native people are, are, are a culture of storytellers. And to tell these stories, especially at this level, 
is something that's warranted. So, you know, it's, it's good to see, and I'm excited for it, you know, bring it on, bring on more native content and, 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 and it's showing itself to, to be lucrative for the studios. They're saying, wow, okay, this is working out. We only have about 30 seconds left, but what most excites you about this project? Is that, you know, this is a jumping off point. And I think we're going to continue to see more and more uh, Native heroes, Native inspired artwork, you know, just like Joe Gomez inspired by Captain America. I think we're going to see more and more of this moving forward uh, into Indian country, merging with Marvel and other comic universes. I think it's going to be fantastic. Vincent Schilling, thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Join us again tomorrow and online at IndianCountryToday.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. This is Indian Country Today.